American Academy in Rome, Columbia University, and three Mellon Fellowships at Vanderbilt U. At USI, he taught senior graduate courses in the ancient Near East, the age of Augustus and primitive Christianity, upper level courses in Greek, Roman, medieval, Renaissance, and Reformation history. And besides his book on the Shroud, he's also had one on uh, Augustus, Cicero, King Arthur, the historical common Dracula, Columbus, and also one on the Holy Grail. He was selected by peers as a distinguished professor in 1994. Over to you, Professor Savoni. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Welcome. Is this mic on? This mic is on. Hello? Is this on? I want to be heard. I don't know. It may be on. Is it? No, he's gone for the day. It was on when he came up. And then Barry turned it off. I'm seeing an off switch. I Oh, maybe he hit the mute button oh. here. I hit it again? Yeah. Hello? There we go. Whoa, yeah. that's it. That's yeah. what it was. Oh, I wasn't that alert, I guess. Too many buttons. <clears throat> I, changed the t I changed the title of the talk just to let you feel like more of a challenge. Um, the title does serve as an advanced clue to, that the story is rather complex. I'm counting on your general familiarity with uh, Arturian and syndonological things uh, to provide what is necessary to make my argument convincing. So in a sense, we're all in this together. Lucky you. And I'm hoping it will be a worthwhile adventure. What I would like to cover today represents a summary of material in two articles that I've written in Arturiana in 1999 and publications of the Media Association of Middle West in 2003. Those articles contain a good survey of background materials, uh, the early grail sources that propel my argument, little research by Arturian scholars. Until now, scholars of early British history, including the great R.G. Collingwood, have mentioned but not seriously pursued the crucial and essential role of the history and legends associated with the ancient city-state of Edessa, Today it's called Turkey, uh, Urfa, and it's in southern Turkey. As they seek answers to the question of the Grail's Christian origins in Britain. It is this Edessa connection which underlies and explains a series of misunderstandings by which Edessan texts, kings, and possible conversion to the Christian faith in the first century have been recast in Britain. I do. Well, that's you don't need to use the uh, the mouse. I'm gonna use it. See, that's why it's not this. Here, I didn't touch the mouse. Well, somebody did. Okay. Okay, Carol. If you see that up on the screen, click the click the mouse so that it's gone, and then the remote will work. Oh, okay. Okay. My hero. Well, the second slide was going to be, I'm hoping this will be a worthwhile adventure. <laughs> the third slide would be, until now, scholars of early British history um, have not really appreciated the connection to the ancient city-state of Edessa. That's where the shroud comes into this talk. So um, it is this Edessa connection which underlies and explains a sequence of misunderstandings by which Edessan text kings and possible conversion to the Christian faith in the first century have been recast in Britain. It will explain why two French poets, Chrétien de Troyes and Robert de Boron, I call him Robert because I don't do French too well, laid the story of the Holy Grail, perhaps the most precious object in Christendom, not in France, 
but surprisingly in Britain. Similarly, scholars have not overly wondered much about the absence of an er any early primary source record in British history of a, er a certain late second century British King Lucius, first mentioned by Venerable Bede in 731, and of an earlier first century king named Arviragus, first named in 1136, first named in 1136 by um, Geoffrey of Monmouth, one of the great historians of Britain, and of the major part they were set to play in Britain's early history and conversion. But though, were those names just plucked out of the air by Bede and Geoffrey? I hope to provide convincing answers to this question and to another crucial question put succinctly by Geoffrey Ash, he's one of the great Arthur scholars, when he asked, why Joseph? Meaning, of course, what is Joseph of Arimathea doing in Britain? So I'm now understandably happy to report that some important scholars of Ar Arturiana have expressed a general acceptance of my project. Among these are Knights Templar expert Malcolm Barber, premier Glastonbury scholar named James Carley of York University in, in uh, Canada, and Bonnie Wheeler of Southern Methodist University, ed editor of Arturiana, and uh, Edessa scholar Ian Wilson. Why is my hypothesis important? It's largely important because the excellent recent book by premier Grail scholar Richard Barber has not discovered it. I'm therefore beholden to him for his truly consummate studies on the Grail and more so for his omissions. The truth, as you have begun to sense, is that we are going to a place generally outside the purview of Grail scholars. Barber and I, and perhaps many of you here, agree that the Grail is primarily a literary symbol which has developed in over centuries into much more. His book has properly counseled those who search for such literary origins to make sure they document each stage, document by document. So I'll leave it to you to judge if adequate documentation is brought forth by my hypothesis. What is or is not the grail? First, I would like to examine with you some of the background underlying the romances of the Holy Grail. Edessa will have, <coughs> Edessa will have its part here too. Perhaps the most significant fact about the Holy Grail is that it entered the world in two works of fiction Therefore, there's no intrinsic reason why it should be a real thing. Many vessels have been claimed to be the Holy Grail or the cup used by Jesus at the Last Supper still today in Valencia, Spain, Wales, Antioch, and elsewhere. Many claimants do not make the Holy Grail any more real than no claimants. A Last Supper cup was seen and kissed by the monk Arcolphus in the seventh century in Jerusalem, and the cup was quote unquote found by crusaders in Caesarea in 1101 during the First Crusade. But these were not called the Grail. This means the Holy Grail is a literary object. It has reality only on the written page. So where did it begin? Expert opinions are it derived from Celtic or Scythian, Southern Russian, or Ethiopian, and on and on, cups, cauldrons or cornucopias? Yes, every mythology, culture, or religion in the world has dreamed this dream since time immemorial. Most of them tell of a magical object that serves a multitude of people, whatever food they have a taste for at the moment, and it never runs dry. It's the Garden of Eden again. Our Holy Grail entered the world between 1180 and 1200. The time of the Crusades, in the Middle East, when crusading knights were coming and going between Europe and the Byzantine Greek East, including the Holy Land. Up to that time, nobody had ever heard of the Holy Grail. Could the elements of the Grail stories have been drawn from Byzantine Greece or the Middle East? One answer would be yes. At the risk of singing to the choir, let's see what these earliest 12th century writers <clears throat> said the Grail was. The first person to write about the Holy Grail was Chrétien de Troyes. He put it in his poetical romance about the knight Percival, called The Story of the Grail. 
Though he was French, for some reason, he set the story in Britain. Percival is going to Arthur's court to be knighted by King Arthur. He stays the night on a, at a castle. After dinner, a procession enters the hall where all the knights were seated and a young damsel carries in the grail, a large platter holding only a communion host. The damsel continues through the hall to a room where she gives the host to an old and crippled king. This is all he ever eats. Young Percival had been advised by his elders not to ask too many questions, so he never inquired about this strange experience. But for not asking, he was put out of the castle and the castle disappeared. Later in the story, a hermit monk that he visits calls the grail a holy object. What is left of the poem deals with Percival's quest to find that grail castle again. Unfortunately, Cretzion died before finishing his poem. In all literature or art, this is the first reference to a holy grail. A few years after Cretzion, about 1186, 1200 in there, Robert de Boron, Robert again, that's the last time I do Robert, okay. Um, Robert wrote the history of the Holy Grail, or it's also called the Joseph, in a work quite, quite different from Cretzion's, which revolved around questing knights, Robert gave the Grail an ancient history. Starting from the New Testament, he defined the Grail as the cup used by Jesus at the Last Supper, and he made Joseph of Arimathea the major player in the story. Robert's Grail is a chalice or a cup. Many of us have wondered, perhaps, why there was confusion about whether the Grail was a, a dish or a cup. I never read this anywhere, but the Greek word which came over into Latin as calyx, or chalice, was kylix, or kylix, K-Y-L-I-X. A kylix is a wide bowl on a short stem found in classical antiquity and in the medieval Greek or Byzantine liturgy. It looks like a dish, but it was a drinking cup. Actually, a monk named Helenand of Foidma, northwest of Paris, a contemporary of Gretzian and Robert, writing about 1206, says that in ordinary conversation, a graltz, seems to be the same word, is a shallow bowl or dish which contained fine foods served in succession. My friend Antonio Furtado in Brazil has made the same claim in his fine study of the medieval Alexander Romance where a grail might be found on anyone's table. So Cretzian and Robert have just made an everyday word into a significant religious object. In several romances, the Holy Grail can also feed a multitude whatever each taste desires. It seems to be just like those magical vessels of mythology uh, that were never called the Grail. So what's the difference? The difference is that we can find specific written sources from which Robert took the ideas for his mainstream grail history. His sources, sometimes borrowed in fine detail by Robert, can be found among the hundreds of stories in the New Testament apocryphal tradition. And most, but not all of them, originated in the Greek or Syriac Christian tradition of the Middle East. Ancient sources used by Robert. What are these apocryphal hidden sources? Apocryphal means hidden. They are not found and were never included in any Bible, Catholic, Protestant, or in any language. Though originating in the Greek and Syriac East, the ancient apocryphal documents that Robert used had already come west. They had already been translated into Latin. I'm talking about a huge collection. You have an example here, over a thousand pages in a modern book of anonymous stories that most people have never heard of. The New Testament, gave rise to spin-offs in the first five or six centuries. They looked like modest embellishments of New Testament accounts until we realized that they diverge from the canonical New Testament and start to say something outrageously false. Think Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. It's a lecture for another time, maybe. Remember the Apocrypha do not mention the grail. Robert used these, creatively inserting the grail in their already embellished stories. We're talking layers here, New Testament, Apocrypha, and then the grail writers. 
Here are a few examples of these New Testament apocrypha used by Robert. The Gospel of Nicodemus, also known as the Acts of Pilate, originated between the second and sixth century. It depends on who, whose book you're reading. Robert certainly used it. On Good Friday, Nicodemus came out of the closet as a Christian and brought the aloes and myrrh, about a hundred weight, to, a place, uh, to place Jesus uh, in his tomb. But the hero of the, uh, of the Gospel of Nicodemus is Joseph of Arimathea, who is named in all four Gospels for taking Jesus down from the cross, wrapping him in a burial shroud, and giving Jesus his own family tomb. Then he's written out of the New Testament account. So he's making a comeback in, these, in the Gospel of Nicodemus. When we can answer the question, why Joseph, we will understand much better the origins of the Holy Grail. The first 12 chapters of the Gospel of Nicodemus follow the well-known New Testament account of the Passion until the Crucifixion. So far we can accept all this, but then, like all other Apocrypha, the Gospel of Nicodemus takes off on its own. The Jewish leaders imprisoned Joseph in a house for being a Christian. During the night, this is still like Good Friday or Holy Saturday. During the night, Jesus visits Joseph in his cell. Angels lift the house at the four corners, and Joseph walks out free. Jesus then shows Joseph the empty tomb and the empty burial sheet. Next morning, the Jews find Joseph gone, and Caiaphas still had the key. They find Joseph at home in Arimathea. He tells us the story I just told you. <laughs> the similarities between the Gospel of Nicodemus and Robert's story are compelling, and I will get to them in just a minute. Robert also used a Latin apocryphal text of the 5th or 7th century in there from Russian Georgia. Russian Georgia in the news today probably originally in Greek, published in Russian, translated into German, and dictionaries blazing into English by me. I call it the I, Joseph, since it was told in the first person by, you know, Joseph. Starting again from the New Testament, Joseph tells how he went to Pilate to beg for the body of Jesus uh, for burial. Pilate gave permission and the new embellishments begin. So I, Joseph, he says, I, Joseph, climbed up to Golgotha with the burial sheet. There, I'll go back away from him, there he sees Jesus' blood dripping into the sand. So he rushes up and captures the precious blood in the burial wrap. Then, back to the New Testament, he wraps Jesus' body and seals it in the sepulcher. This text is the earliest mention of Joseph capturing Jesus' blood at the cross. It also is important because it tells of Joseph and the, the Apostle Philip founding a church at Lida, west of Jerusalem. Robert's achievement doesn't get enough credit. His, these embellishments of the New Testament accounts will now be further overlaid by Robert and others. They are like writing screenplays of the New Testament story and adding stuff for dramatic effect. Think Mel Gibson. Now let us look at the origins of the Grail as told by Robert. <clears throat> His book, it's both in, uh, written in, uh, we, uh, versions of it in uh, prose and in poetry. So whether he wrote it first in first verse or first in prose, it's the very first ever to take up the subject of the, the Grail's history, as nearly all modern Grail scholars accept. Robert retells the familiar New Testament story of Joseph asking Pilate for permission to bury Jesus. Pilate says, okay, all as in the New Testament and the Gospel of Nicodemus. Here, Robert's wonderful creativity, I love him, kicks in. As Joseph was leaving, Pilate says, wait a minute, wait a minute. A cleanup person had retrieved the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper, and Pilate gives it to Joseph of Arimathea. If, you need, if you're a Christian, you probably can use this more than I can, he says, something like that. So, here, um, as Joseph, uh, 
Now when Joseph goes up to Golgotha to bury Jesus, he's carrying the, the burial sheet. We expect that. But now also that cup. Again, he sees the blood dripping from Jesus, so he runs up to capture it, just like in the eye of Joseph. But in Robert, he kept, collects it, not in the cup, I mean, not in the, the burial sheet, but in the cup of the Last Supper, which he calls a vessel, a vessel, and then a calice, and not the burial shroud. 30 lines later in the poem, Robert begins calling the cup the grail, cup of Jesus' transubstantiated blood and now of his real blood. Again, Joseph is imprisoned. And again, as in the Gospel of Nicodemus, Jesus visits him in the cell. In Robert, however, jo uh, Jesus does not free Joseph, but brings him the grail which Joseph had hidden in his own house before his arrest. And he teaches Joseph the secrets of the grail. I'm not going to touch this at all right now, but stay tuned. Then he leaves Joseph in his prison until Roman Emperor Vespasian releases him much later. And here's the story of the third apocryphal book that um, Robert used. Um, it's called the Vindicta Salvatoris, or the v Revenge of the Savior. It described a well-known event, major event in the history of Rome and her province of Judea, where all this is happening. The real historical event is that, maybe you know this, in the year 70, the Romans got fed up with Jewish zealots constantly making trouble and with snipers called assassins, killing Roman boys stationed there. And the, the Emperor Vespasian sent his son Titus to destroy Jerusalem, not as in the real historical event this time, but to punish Ju Jerusalem for the crucifixion of Jesus. So a real event in Roman history is now being turned uh, to the uh, purposes of the poet. The Revenge of the Savior, dated about 650, first time it appears in, in literature, it does a typical apocryphal update. In this story, Vespasian, who ruled Rome 69 to 79, Vespasian has a really bad, like odiferous, case of leprosy. He hears about Jesus who healed lepers, and he also hears that Pontius Pilate had let him die on the cross. But there is still hope for him. Someone tells him about a woman who had a flow of blood for many years, whom Jesus had cured, and who now had a miraculous image of Jesus, his face on a cloth. In the New Testament, she is nameless, but now she is called Veronica. If Vespasian believed in Jesus and touched that cloth, they said, he would be healed. <clears throat> so Vespasian had Veronica brought to Rome and was cleansed by her image, became a believer, not true, don't believe it. And um, he determined to punish the people who had crucified Jesus. What follows in the story is the actual sack of Jerusalem by the Romans. I described it already. But now the motive is totally different. It is to avenge Jesus. Just as a side note, by the way, since it was really Vespasian's son Titus who sacked Jerusalem, Jerusalem in 70, I should add that both the father and the son shared the same nomenclature, Titus Flavius Vespasianus. So the mistake of the story, or understandable mistake of the story, is um, uh, apparent, is, is now understandable. Back to Robert. He gives the same story of Vespasian's leprosy in, in all its details, only calling the woman Verine instead of Veronica. Remember that he had left Joseph in, of Arimathea in the prison. He continues adding his own details and touches. After the sack of the city, Vespasian hears about a fellow Christian who had been imprisoned in a room in a deep pit about 40 years previously and who has had no food for all that time. But he thinks that maybe Jesus, just maybe, has kept him alive. Vespasian excitedly lowers himself into the underground cell. When he gets to the bottom, he sees an old man who says, Vespasian, finally. <laughs> it is Joseph, and he is clean and fresh, has been kept quite well fed by the grail all those years. He is freed, and then he gathers a Christian group around him and sends 
his invented sister, Anegius, and her husband, Bran, and someone named Petrus, possibly Peter, to an undefined place called Avaron. We expect Avalon. Robert doesn't give us. He gives us Avaron. Far to the west, <clears throat> with the grail, cup of the Last Supper, and cup of Jesus' actual blood. In later romances that use Robert, Joseph himself goes west with the grail. Can there be any doubt from the point-by-point -point similarities between these three apocrypha, the Gospel of Nicodemus, the I, Joseph, and the Revenge of the Savior, that they were Robert's sources for his original grail story? There is much more. After Robert's Joseph, other romancers, uh, romances, poets, some metrical but mostly in prose, used these original ideas of Robert and piled more on, <laughs> on them, added their own creative embellishments. They are quest narratives joined to Robert's ancient history. These were chiefly the Perlevaux, the Vulgate Quest, and the Vulgate Estoire, or history of the Grail. With Robert, therefore, they take their start from the New Testament and its apocryphal extensions, and they go, they, they run with it. The Knights Questing for, the Knights Questing for the Holy Grail rarely found success. Only the best knight could achieve it. In the prose romance Perlevo, Sir Gawain achieved the secret of the Grail. That is, he fulfilled the quest. What is the Grail's ultimate secret that only the greatest knight may experience? In the Grail, Gawain, in, in a way, in, in, in a sense, in the role of Perlevo, uh, Percival, first sees the infant Jesus. Then the Grail is removed from his presence. When it next comes before Gawain, he sees in it the crucified Jesus. The Christ child has changed into the adult Christ of the Last Supper. Here the secret of the Holy Grail was to experience Christ born as a child and Christ crucified. In the Vulgate Quest, uh, dated around 1215 to 1235, barely a generation after Robert, the hero is Galahad. He never sinned and he was never tempted. Hello, can we talk? <laughs> never tempted. He also sees in the grail this polymorphic or changing Jesus. Here's a scene in the quest in which the best knight achieves the secret of the Holy Grail. Quote, next, Josephus. Josephus is an invented son of Joseph of Arimathea. You know he's not in the New Testament for sure, right? Josephus entered upon the consecration of the mass. He took from the vessel a host made in the likeness of bread. As he raised it aloft, there descended from above a figure like a child who entered into the bread, which took on human form before his eye, the eyes of all of those assembled there. Then raising his eyes, Josephus saw the figure of a man appeared, appear from out of the holy vessel, unclothed and bleeding from his hands and feet and side." End of quote. Right after that, Galahad dies, having achieved all he could ever wish for in life. This polymorphic Jesus also plays in another episode in the Perlevo. The writer of that book followed Robert, and here he is original. King Arthur this time rides out alone to seek forgiveness for his sins. He comes to the chapel of St. Austin. St. Augustine is one of the first bishops of England. He goes to the chapel of St. Austin where the Grail Mass is going on. And I'll quote this. At the hermit, or priest's, right hand he could see the most beautiful child that ever a man beheld. To the left was a lady so beautiful, no beauty in the world could match hers. The lady took her son, setting him on her knees and kissing him gently. Sire, she said, you are my father and my son, and my lord and my guardian, and the guardian of everyone. King Arthur marveled that she called a child both her father and her son. Are you beginning to guess who this is? <laughs> yeah. Arthur then saw the lady offer her child to the blessed priest, the hermit. He placed the child on the altar and then began the sacrament. 
To the king, it seemed that the hermit was holding in his arms a man, bleeding from his side, hands, and feet, and crowned with thorns. Then he looked back towards the altar, and he thought he saw the man's body changed back into the shape of the child he had seen before. A fourth example, last one, this is the best, or worst, <clears throat> is found in the Vulgate Estoire, which seems uh, here to be a defense of, the real, uh, of a real transubstantiation of bread and wine. Though somewhat repulsive, it tries to re reconstruct the moment when Christ established a pattern for the future Eucharistic service of the Mass. Picture the scene. Jesus is instructing Josephus in celebrating the first ever sacrament, repeating the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, take and eat, take and drink, etc. Quote now. And the bread <clears throat> immediately became flesh, and the wine, blood. Then Josephus saw that he was holding between his two hands a body of a child, and it seemed to him that the blood in the chalice had fallen from the child's body. Then our Lord said to him, you must break apart what you are holding so that there are three pieces. Josephus replied, oh Lord, my heart could not bear to break apart such a, a beautiful child. Then upon the Lord's insistence, Josephus took the body and putting the head to one side, broke it off from the trunk as easily as if the flesh of the child were cooked. Next, fearfully, he broke the rest in two parts. Our Lord spoke, take what is before you and eat it. And he saw, all he saw before him was bread. He took it and opened his mouth to eat. And he saw that he still held an entire human body. With me. That's transubstantiation for you. It's not a simple coincidence it is not a simple coincidence that the Byzantine Greek Eucharist communion service using leavened bread is reflected in these Western Grail narratives. The stories did originate in the Greek world and are modified here by, in Latin. <clears throat> uh, but we must dig a bit deeper, back again in the Apocrypha. Where did the polymorphic Jesus legend originate? Would you believe Edessa? Now we're at the point of no return on our sword bridge. I know that some of my audience are being drawn in over unfamiliar ground. I ask you to stay the course. Did I say that? <laughs> in Edessa, an icon on cloth bearing the life-size face of Jesus is documented in the Syriac Apocryphon called the Teaching of Adai, Doctrina Adai, dating from the late fourth century and with different details in the 6th century Greek Acts of Thaddeus. Thaddeus would be Greek for Adai. The icon's history and legends are well known among students of the Syriac and Byzantine East and among students of the Shroud of Turin. So it was, um, uh, in fact, copies of this um, uh, icon were made dating from the 10th century and, and later. So it was a real one, and at the very least must have been an impressive icon. But how it came to Edessa is wrapped in the several elaborations of the legends of surrounding the Edessan king, Abgar V Ukama, ruled 13 to 50 CE, contemporary of Jesus. Briefly, <clears throat> this actual king of Edessa had an undefined ailment. In the teaching of Adai, Abgar sent his agents on a mission to the Roman governor staying at Eleutheropolis, the town. Remember Eleutheropolis, okay? On their return, they reported see, seeing Jesus healing the sick. Abgar wrote a letter to Jesus asking him to come and heal him. And this was seen in Edessa's archives and copied around 320 by the first great extant historian of the church, Eusebius. One of his agents, Abgar's agents, Hanan, is credited with making the first picture of Jesus' face, which he brought back and which healed Abgar. This began the long succession of frontal Jesus' faces in art, 
In the Acts of Thaddeus, Hanan could not achieve his portrait because of the brilliance surrounding Jesus' face. Jesus wiped his face on a cloth, leaving his image miraculously on the cloth. It was subsequently described as akeropoietos, not made by hands. The next point is crucial, okay? Edessa's archives note that Abgar V kept the cloth, cloth in his castle and rarely displayed it in public. However, on Easter it was displayed publicly all day in an interesting, if unexplained, manner. We are told at the first hours of day, 7 a.m., the image appeared as the infant Jesus. At the third hour, as a child, at the sixth hour, as a youth, and at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., as the crucified Jesus. Are you thinking Galahad? Are you thinking polymorphic Jesus already? How can this be? It was supposedly only a facial image of Jesus in his ministry. Let us look more closely at the Acts of Thaddeus. Here the anonymous writer, I'm tempted to, because of the details he gives, I'm tempted to see him as a white, an eyewitness of Edessa's Jesus icon. Rightly or wrongly. <clears throat> Um, anyway, the anonymous writer um, called the image cloth of Jesus' face a syndon tetradiplon, Greek. The Greek word syndon is the three synoptic gospels word for Jesus' burial wrap. Though the, uh, though the, uh, the image was supposedly of Jesus' face only, we now read the Greek word, very rare by the way, tetradiplon, which means folded in eight layers, uh, was the, the uh, other um, definer of this cloth. Soon after, so anyway, I, I should add, these words, syndon tetradiplon, must mean, if they mean anything, a larger cloth, something like a burial cloth that size, folded in eight layers. Soon after that, the disciple Thaddeus arrived bringing the cloth to Abgar, seeing which Abgar sprang up, forgetting the paralysis of his legs and ran to Thaddeus. He believed and was healed. We are reminded of the cripple, crippling wound of the Grail King in the Grail Romances and the also apocryphal Veronica story used by the revenge of the savior, used in the revenge of the savior. There it was Roman Emperor Vespasian who was healed by a miraculous image on cloth. Can this be the origin of the crippled grail king in those late, later stories? In time, the Edessans began to regard their image cloth as the burial wrap of Jesus. That is, it was larger. And when that happened, the name of Joseph of Arimathea became quietly associated with Edessa. So by the time of the Grail Romances, Joseph was already linked to Edessa. In 944, Edessa's cloth was sent to Constantinople. There an eyewitness account, the narration of the Edessa uh, image, repeated the Abgar story, as I've get, given it to you two or three times now, but he repeated it. Um, <clears throat> but also gave a new version of the origin of the cloth's image, which transferred this sindon which we see before us, that's a quote, to the night in Gethsemane where Jesus wiped his face covered with bloody sweat. The blood was confirmed on the face of this icon. In the sermon of eyewitness Gregory Referendarius, uh, which he delivered upon the cloth's arrival, in Constantinople. These two texts suggest that for the first time, for the first time that the image from Edessa appeared bloodstained. This and the word sindan, again, seems to uh, confirm our suspicion that it was a burial shroud icon, formerly kept folded in eight, as the Edessenes had already noticed, and which brought Joseph of Arimathea into the story of Edessa. We will have to return to Edessa in the exciting conclusion 
of my talk. In Constantinople II, the icon inspired new and empathetic art motifs, namely large, a large threnos, or lament, threnos means lamentation, uh, uh, murals showing Jesus lying on his burial sheet, and also exquisitely woven liturgical epitaphioi with the same type of Jesus lying in state. A fresco of the 16th century is the most direct representation available to me of the carrying of the epitaphios in the Byzantine procession of the great entry during Holy Week. Notice the figure of Jesus on the cloth. A third new motif known as the man of pity depicted Jesus vertically and apparently rising from his coffin. These seem inspired by the realism of Edessa's blood-stained icon. Excuse me for one moment. I'm talking to, um, we're giving a talk like this to academicians, people in the college community at the um, professional meetings. I get bad looks when I mention Shroud of Turin. So I use the expression, Edessa icon. We all know what I'm talking about. Okay? <laughs> and it's, in, it's written in this way. So. Thanks for the ice, honey. A fresco of the 16th century, that, um, that one, um, that's right, I mentioned that already, um, shows a Byzantine procession of the great entry, and it's in, it comes from the monastery church of Kaisariani in Athens. A third new motif known as the man of pity, yeah, depicted Jesus vertically ar apparently arising from his coffin. These seem inspired by the realism of Edessa's bloodstained icon. And this genre also came to the West to become a regular part of Eucharistic iconography. Also in Constantinople, a new approach to the Eucharist, the Eucharistic ritual called the melismos, appeared in the 11th century and was depicted by the child lying on a Greek Hylix or chalice, or on a paten next to a chalice in large murals visible to all. The word melismos means, refers to the fraction or breaking of the bread, the communion. Here recall yet again Edessa's Easter display of the changing Jesus. In the Byzantine liturgy, the Greeks use a loaf of leavened bread and not the unleavened communion hosts used in the West. In the melismos, the loaf was now brought to the altar, covered by a cloth with an image of the infant Jesus. As the priest cut the loaf into communion morsels with an altar knife called a lonke, or lance, the infant's body was symbolically cut. The infant has ritually changed into the crucified at the moment of communion. Why ever would the Byzantines use such a ritual when the Eucharistic event has only to do with the Jesus of the Last Supper and Crucifixion. Given the also new Threnos liturgy, Jesus lying in state on his burial wrap, and the new empathetic art of the pa uh, wait a minute. and the new empathetic art of the Passion since the arrival of the Edessan image in the capital, it is entirely likely that the custom of the Easter ritual display of the Edessan image, infant first, then crucified, came to Constantinople in the baggage of the icon, so to speak, and was reflected in the polymorphic Jesus in the melismo service. Western Knights in Constantinople in 1201, who attended church services in the Greek liturgy for about a year before the fighting broke out called the Fourth Crusade, 1201 to 1204, they could not help noticing a strange communion service so different from their Latin Catholic mass. These were experiences that they would have brought home in the very period when the great romances were being developed in the fertile minds of French poets. Edessa then may have been, may well have been the ur source of the very essential secret of the Holy Grail in the 13th century Grail stories, the child changing to the crucified. 
It was the very secret experienced by the greatest knights of Arthur's realm. There are no grail stories in the old Apocrypha, only legends, art, church rituals that seem to have originated with the cloth of Edessa, bearing the image of Jesus' face and or entire body. The icon was not the grail, <clears throat> but both objects are similar in that they both supposedly contain the blood and or body of Jesus. Though Ro through Robert, that most precious object in the East became connected to a new thing in the West called the Holy Grail. In the West, the story of Abgar, Edessa, and the shroud with Jesus' miraculous image was actually known long before Robert wrote. The Abgar story is found in the late fourth century travel diary of a woman named Egeria, visitor to Edessa and the Holy Land from either Spain or Aquitaine, and also in several other Latin versions from the 8th to the 13th century. It's not brand new when, when the, the Grail poets got hold of it, but they, uh, um, they capitalized on it, let's say. <clears throat> the most prominent ones that uh, we know about uh, come in an Iconodule, a lover of icons, sermon of Pope Stephen III in 769, in Ordericus Vitalis around 1131, <clears throat> and in Gervais of Tilbury around 1211, the time when Robert was writing. Robert must have read some Latin version, and we have to wonder why he just didn't write a, a story of this famous cloth. One part of the answer is that he may have written his very inventive fable to explain that strange grail that Cretzian had introduced since Cretzian had died before completing his story. But also, and most importantly, in his day, Robert's day, 1180, 1210, in there, intellectuals were having hot discussions about the bread on the altar. Did it really become the body of Christ or just symbolically? It's a good question. In Rome in 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council of all the bishops of the world who could attend concluded that the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus when the priest says, this is my body and this is my blood. Remember the Vulgate Estuar, which was based on Robert's Joseph and which gave the gruesome story of Josephus? <clears throat> there seems no doubt that Robert was also already preoccupied with the Eucharistic transubstantiation question. Which at, that, which at that moment overshadowed the complex history of Veronica's veil or the Edessan cloth. Even so, Robert worked them into his grail story. This is interesting, hold on. Robert didn't write about the shroud, but he worked them in, <laughs> it worked it in. Um, Um, when, when his, Robert's Verine was found with her healing image that Vespasian had sent somebody to find, um, she says to Vespasian's Roman messengers, quote, now be seated and you shall see the shroud. She calls it suer. You know, Veronica had a, t a towel that wiped Jesus' face, of course. She said, you shall see the shroud or suer, which is a French word, for shroud, on which God wiped his face. They ask, how do you come by this suer? She says, I had a length of cloth. The word is sidwan. It's a word for French word for the sindan uh, that has come west uh, from the, the Greek New Testament. I had, I had a length of cloth, or sidwan, made for me and I was carrying it home. I took the cloth and gent gently wiped his face for him, for he was sweating heavily, so heavily that his whole body, tu seco, was dripping with it. When I got home and looked at my cloth, I saw this likeness upon it, just as it appears now. The French words used by Robert, Sidwan and Suer, applied to Varine's cloth, both translate the Greek word sindon, used in the synoptics for the Good Friday shroud brought for Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea. At this point in Robert's story, there would have been no contextual reason 
for Robert to use those words, in the, put those words in the mouth of Berene. It may be concluded that, directly or not, Robert's sources, that is, the apocryphal holy face legends of Abgar in Edessa and the New Testament accounts of Joseph's burial shroud must have delivered him his vocabulary. It is not widely known, not widely known, that Veronica's legendary cloth image of Jesus' face was prominent as an offshoot of Edessa's really existing cloth image. As evidence of this, Macarius of Magnesium, about 400 CE, wrote that Veronica was a princess of Edessa. He made it up, as far as I know, but it came to him somehow. And Moses of Corini, about 800, wrote that she was the wife of Abgar. That's almost as bad as Magdalene and Jesus. Anyway, she was the wife of Abgar, so she is a spin-off, and her cloth, a spin-off from the Edessa stories. If you think about it, all the Eastern apocryphal Byzantine and Edessan tales and quasi-historical accounts that I have discussed are interlaced so as to form a hypothesis that I hope you will find to be internally consistent and compelling. The origins of the Holy Grail are found in non-canonical apocryphal stories about a real burial shroud icon in Edessa and in Constantinople. By the time the stories reached the West, they had undergone many elaborations. Robert of Boron's masterpiece of about 1200 was to bring them all together in his first history of the Holy Grail. Okay, we're nearing the other side of the bridge. Why Britain? Early on, we wondered why two French poets writing about French poets writing about 12. 1200 would set their grail stories in Britain. We wondered why Joseph of Arimathea was brought to Britain without a single ancient document attesting to it. Now answers can be proffered. In my two articles, I laid out the supporting documents for the old argument among British historians that Bede's fictitious British King Arthur, who he wrote, brought Christianity to England in the late second century was actually an historical King Lucius Abgar VIII, 177 to 12, King of Edessa, also late second century. Adolf Harnack, a premier historian of early Christianity of a century ago, considered this very question and stated that only one King Lucius in the world espoused Christianity in the late second century. Lucius Abgar VIII of Edessa. Harnack's immense research, this guy is a great among greats, in 1904 has provided solid grounding for the position that I'm taking in the paper. British King Lucius is known to have entered history rather suddenly in the pages of Bede's ecclesiastical history. <clears throat> in his preface, Bede identified his friend Nuthelm then in Rome, searching in the archives for information bearing on the church in Britain. He had a research assistant. It is virtually certain now that it was not him who apprised Bede of the entry under Pope Eleutherus, who, who was the Pope from 171 to 185, late second century, in Rome's book called the Liber Pontificalis, the Book of the Popes. Uh, okay. This uh, passage, passage reads, quote, this pope received a letter from British King Lucius, Lucio Britannio Rege, asking that he might become a Christian by his agency. And it was Bede who transplanted that king and that second century event from Edessa to Britain still then a, promise, a province of Rome without national kings. Recalled in the fourth century teaching of Adai, Abgar V, who died in 50 or so, had sent a delegation to the Roman governor at Eleutheropolis, literally city of Eleutherus. This cannot be factual since the Roman emperor Septimius Severus changed the name of a town Beth Gubrin to Eleutheropolis in 200 CE. 
There was no Eleutheropolis in the time of Abgar V. It's about 150 years after him. Other clues coming out of this fourth century text are the names of Palut, first bishop of Edessa, and Serapion, bishop of Antioch at the time. Both of these individuals belong to the time not of Abgar V or Jesus, but of Lucius Abgar VIII in the late second century. <coughs> Meanwhile, an entry in Edessa's still extant city archives attests to the presence of Christianity in 201 by recording the destruction of its Christian church in that year by flood. Another entry records the construction <coughs> of Edessa's Citadel Castle, Citadel Castle in 205, 205, both under Lucius Abgar VIII. It is thus certain that Christianity had come to Edessa by the time of this king. The common window of years falling within the reigns of Lucius Abgar VIII and Pope Eleutherus being 177 to 185, that is the moment. More than incidentally, Eusebius reports that the church leaders in Phrygia and Osroene, whose chief city was Edessa, had communicated with Roman Pope Eleutherus and his successor in the time of Lucius Abgar VIII. There is no reason to doubt the historicity of these lines in Eusebius. So Abgar VIII of Osroene, who historian Dio Cassius, 150 to 235, late second century, who historian Dio Cassius says paid a state visit, visit to Rome, could have discussed in Rome con his contemplated conversion and corresponded with the Pope about having Christian missionaries in his region. Here's the conclusion you've been all waiting for. <clears throat> what is not commonly known is that the word for citadel castle in ancient Syriac, the dialect of Aramaic spoken in Edessa was birta or birtha. Further textual documentation is found in a Latin translation of a book by Clement of Alexandria called the Hippotyposes or Topics. Clement of Alexandria, late second century, one of the early fathers of Christianity. That the disciples, Jude Thaddeus and Judas Thomas, were buried in Britium Edesse Norum. Any Latin scholars here? Britium of the Edessenes. So when Birta, or Birtha, Aramaic, came over into Latin, it came over as Britium. Since it seems certain now that Edessa's citadel came over in, as Britium in Latin, Bedes, or not Helms, Lucio Britannio Rege was pardonable. But that mistake has had far-reaching results in Arturian studies, even to this very moment. We can now also be sure that the Liber Pontificalis recorded the event accurately by making Lucius Abgar the one who was instrumental in bringing the faith to Edessa, also known as Britium. It seems certain that the apostolic conversion of first century Abgar V did not happen. And we may even plausibly suspect that Lucius Abgar VIII retrojected his own conversion story back into the time of his ancestor in order to claim an apostolic foundation for Edessa's church so that the Edessa might become a rival in the faith to its neighbors, Nisibis and Adiabene. One short episode remains. About the time, 1136, when William of Malmesbury was writing his De Antiquitate Glastoniae, History of Glastonbury Abbey, William of Malmesbury, Geoffrey of Monmouth found a certain non-existent British king named Arviragus. In five lines, he found him in five lines of satire four by the Roman satirist Juvenal. I give only the operative line. O Emperor, you will capture some king. Perhaps Arviragus will tumble out of his crude British wagon. <laughs> 
Timone Britannio in Latin. Typically, Jeffrey, who cited only Juvenal, expanded that line into seven pages. Made it up, okay? The reader of Arturian and Grail narratives from Cretian to the post-Vulgate texts does not find a trace of an Arviragus anywhere. Neither do the earliest mainstream his, uh, histories of Britain, from Gildas to Pseudonenius mention him. Tacitus, Diocassius, and Herodian, Roman historians who were near contemporaries of, of Juvenal and who reported Rome's entry into Britain do not know of him, nor does fourth century Ammianus Marcellinus, who wrote a continuation of Tacitus well into Christian times. Geoffrey found, of Monmouth found Arviragus in the, in the comic lines of the satirist Juvenal. I could go on about what, how funny those lines really turn out to be, but okay. <clears throat> anyway, after Juvenal, who flourished about 120, Arviragus was not named by any writer known to me in the next thousand years from Juvenal to Geoffrey. Correctives are welcome. If you have any, let me know. After Geoffrey, we don't find his name again in Britain until about 1250, when Adam of Dummeram of Glastonbury, and later, 1350, John of Glastonbury, revised William of Malmesbury's history of Glastonbury by inventing a first century conversion of Britain. Who else did that? Abgar the Eighth in Britium. In their new recension of this book, this history, Joseph of Arimathea received land in Glastonbury for Europe's first Christian church from, Jeffrey, from Jeffrey's non-existent British king, Arviragus. Or perhaps Juvenal knew a real British king, Arviragus. In Juvenal's day, Rome was in fact having serious military issues with another Edessan king, Abgar VII, just before the Abgar VIII, who is the star of this uh, movie here, uh, who ruled 109 to 116 in the time of Juvenal. It's no great feat of lingu linguistics to notice that the name of Edessa's Abgar is rendered in Greek sources by Avgaros. And so, when in Geoffrey we meet his copyist's frequent variant, Arvigarus, we must notice that Arvigarus uh, is a virtual homophone of Avgaros. And he is another stolen reference to Edessa's crippled king, Abgar V, the contemporary of Jesus and of Joseph of Arimathea. Abgar V, who also reputedly intro introduced the faith to Edessa in the first century. Now on both sides of the ledger, we find a conscious rewriting of their respective histories in order to throw back the arrival of Christianity to the agency of a direct disciple of Jesus. In Britain, the new chronology, first century Christian, of the arrival of the faith in the first century was purposeful. It came just in time to provide Glastonbury with the prestige and privileges of an apostolic foundation in the time of the conciliar movement. When the council of the conciliar movement replaced the popes as the leaders of the church, the, the older a, a country or a place was as Christian, the earlier they got to speak and the more prestige they got from the rest of the, from the bishops at the councils. So how, con how convenient. Um, the time of the conciliar movement was about 1309 to 1449. We may conclude by listing the many parallels, some striking, in the history of Christianity in Edessa and in Britain. We find a similarity of lands, Britium, Britain, royal names, King Lucius, dates, late second century, accidentals, Eleutherus, Eleutheropolis, and identical story functions to invite missionaries and introduce Christianity into their respective lands. When a new edition of Glastonbury's conversion appeared in the 13th and 14th centuries, more parallels appeared. Now, in both Edessa 
and Brit Britium and Britain, the arrival of the faith was remanufactured so as to come in the first century so that in both places it could be carried by a direct disciple of Jesus, that is Joseph. Again in Britain, the fabricated king's name resonates with that of Edessa's king, Avgaros Arvigaros. In Edessa, it is King Lucius Abgar VIII who is personally associated with all these pairs on both sides. So they consistently fit the events in the reign of an actual king and are not simple coincidences. Most significantly, the Easter display of Edessa's Christ icon, <clears throat> the child Jesus changing into the crucified, culminated in the vision of the greatest knight to achieve, achieve the, the secret of the Holy Grail. All this can now be traced to Edessa. So, we made the crossing. This has been the latest update of research on early sources of the literature of the Holy Grail that I first presented 15 years ago. I am indebted to many scholars before me, too many to name them all, those wonderful Germans, Harnack, Hallier, Zahn, and Kaluga of the late 19th century and early 20th century. The recent studies of James Carley, William Nitze, and Richard O'Gorman, uh, students of the Grail, and the insights of Ian Wilson about Edessa. I especially wish to thank Joseph Marino and Sue for uh, kindly inviting me to share this uh, talk with you. Thank you. Thank you.